us to go and watch a string quartet. And in fact, we were sitting uh, 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 with the people who were playing the music. And for the moment, I, I felt myself uh, to be a musician. <laughs> Only for a moment. And then the other day, the, 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 the next instance, they took us to a jazz club. And we sat with jazz musicians. And the question they asked was, out of these two types of music, which one requires the skills that you need in leadership? Is it the string quartet? Or is it the jazz? And of course, if we are to look at some of the characteristics of uh, of these two genres of music, the string quartet is almost scripted. You want to play it as Beethoven would have played it. In jazz, there is no script. In fact, uh, you, can, you can go off the tune and your colleagues are going to improvise so that it looks like it was not a mistake. <laughs> so this is really what it is all about. Leadership is dynamic. In fact, I think both uh, types of music actually teach us a valuable lessons about leadership. There are times in which you have to look at the script. If you are dealing with issues of climate change, the technologies that you need, that we need to adopt, are in many ways scripted. If, but there are times where, because of uh, the great pace of uncertainty, that you have to improvise like jazz. And this is really what my talk is going to be about. And in my talk, I I would like to answer a number of questions. The first one is what kind of leadership do we need to be able <coughs> to move forward to a truly just transition? What kind of education do we need to ensure that we are fit for purpose? Especially given the fact that uh, the world is very, very dynamic. A few days ago, I went to chat GPT and instructed it, write an essay on Chile Zima Rwanda. And it generated an essay. You can specify the length of the essay. You can specify any topic that you would like to do that. But the questions that we obviously need to ask is, is writing essays looking exactly how a calculator is today? Because before, we used to have elaborate methods of calculating things. But now it's irrelevant. Uh, because you can be able to punch it on your calculator and it gives you the answers. So what kind of education do we need in order to lead in this time of great global change. How do, the other question is, how do we ensure that in this great change, and that it is climate change, that everybody pays a fair due? Because we do know that there are countries that developed on the backs of environment and we are suffering the consequences of this. I did a PhD in England, and one of the things that used to interest me was the pop culture of the British people. Almost everybody in England actually drinks. <laughs> so I asked my supervisor, I said, where did this culture came from? He says, no, no, it came from pollution. What do you mean? It says uh, after the intense. 
intense industrialization of, of Britain, it became dangerous to drink water. <laughs> because uh, all those chemicals were spilling. Of course, that was the time before we had rules. They were spilling into the rivers, and we know how dirty the river Thames was. And because of that, you couldn't dare drink water that has not been sanitized by alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best of the country. So there are countries that have destroyed the environment as they were developing. And we are we have to find a fair way in which we can be able to uh, to uh, uh, to deal with the environment and the contribution, looking at the past, the present, and the future. Then the third thing, we live at a time when Europe, for the first time ever since 1945, is a global center of conflict. The war in Ukraine and the weapons that are that can potentially be used actually should make all of us very concerned. Albert Einstein was once asked, Professor Einstein, what kind of weapons are going to be used to fight the Third World War? And he replied, he does not know what kind of weapons are going to be used to fight the Third World War. But he knows what kind of weapons are going to be used to fight the Fourth World War. And that will be sticks and stones. <laughs> and the reason for that is because if ever there is a Third World War, it is going to destroy civilization as we know it. And conflicts in Europe must be taken seriously because it is Europe that gave us two world wars. It was not Asia, it was not Africa, it was not even the Americas. It was actually Europe. So we need to find a way out of this conflict if the change that we need is going to happen and is going to happen smoothly. And then the other question that I will try to answer is especially given the fact that uh, load shedding has become one of the most popular words in South Africa. <laughs> what is the future of energy? I remember when I was doing Standard 4 and my teacher uh, introduced us to the concept of energy. And of course, uh, DG, uh, uh, bear with me because this is probably is a very simplistic <laughs> definition of energy. But shall will say, what is energy? <laughs> and the answer will be, energy is the ability to do work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you will agree with me, Eugene, that uh, it is very simplistic. <laughs> We need to find an appropriate, optimal energy mix, given all the things that I have talked about. And of course, all this, to answer these questions, we really need leadership. And we need good leadership. As the pandemic unfolded, and I began writing my book, you can go and buy it at exclusive books. <laughs> Leading in the 21st century, I sounded a call for a new type of a leader. After all, against a rapidly changing context, models that has once prevailed have to be challenged. Not only were we navigating an unprecedented global health care, but we were also finding ourselves further and further entrenched in the fourth industrial revolution, which is an age of artificial intelligence. 
a topic which I did a PhD on. <coughs> and this fourth industrial revolution is characterized by the integration of intelligent technologies such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, internet of things, into every facet of our lives with substantial disruption to entire systems and processes. Just to give you an example of a process that was disrupted, after completing my postdoc at Imperial College, I, I thought I had found a perfect job. So I went and joined South African Bluers. <laughs> I was brewing Mutombo <laughs> And at that time, the South African Bluers used to have a, um, a brewery in Ibai, which used to employ 4,000 people. And it was automated. This is 20 years, more than 20 years ago. It was automated, and when that automation was completed, it was the most automated brewery in the southern hemisphere. And it could be operated by 50 people. Instead of 4,000 people, it could be operated by 50 people. And it was producing more beer than the 4,000 people. I don't know whether that is good or bad. <laughs> and of course, we can imagine what the impact of this is on, on uh, employment. And the future of work is a big topic that we need to always bear in mind as we move forward with these global changes that are happening. So that is an example of what the fourth industrial revolution is doing. It is changing every aspect of our lives. When I was addressing a political organization, uh, and then uh, about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, one member of the audience stood up and said, let us not allow the fourth industrial revolution, Amanda. <laughs> and uh, then I realized that we have serious problems. <laughs> because this is it is not, it's not something that we can opt out of. You know, as, I'm, as a vice chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, we have a campus at a place called Dwarenfontein. Dwarenfontein used to be the center of textile manufacturing. Apparently in the 80s, there was even a union called Gao. Uh, the Secretary General happens to be an academic at the University of Johannesburg today, Sydney Informant. And none of those factories are there. They are all gone. One wonders what happens to, uh, what happened to the people who used to work in those factories. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is what happened? And how do we how do we prevent the same thing happening again? It turns out that the advent of cheap manufacturing in Asia actually is responsible for the demise of uh, a dwelling for day. What it means, it means you can say uh, let us not allow the fourth industrial revolution any number of times you like. <laughs> it is not going to stop the South African consumer to buy cheap imported goods. Because when it comes to our consumers, they are not patriotic when they buy. <laughs> they don't go and say, where was it made? <laughs> and then they buy it. In fact, no one is able to do that. When I was an undergraduate student in North America, the best-selling car was Honda. 
and uh, the Americans were very, very worried about their companies. In fact, George Bush, who was the president, went to Japan to try to entangle that. And of course, uh, you can Google this, that's when he puked on the, on the Prime Minister of Japan. <laughs> I think it was because of stress. <laughs> uh, and then, there was buy American campaign where you could go and get get, get uh, uh, petrol at a discounted rate. It never lasted. The only thing that they could do was to improve their competitiveness, and that's exactly what those industries in Jordan Fontaine were supposed to do. And to improve the competitiveness means we will have to embrace the most sophisticated ways of production, including automation. Because if you don't automate, even that job that you have, you are going to lose. And of course, when I talk about this, I'm reminded of an economic uh, theory called uh, the Matthews effect. The Matthews effect uh, was taken from uh, uh, Matthews chapter 22, verses 16, <laughs> which says, to those who have, more shall be added unto them. To those who do not have, even the little that they have, <laughs> shall be taken away from them. <laughs> Myopic to perceive that we can develop without investment into science and innovation. And that is why, DG, your ministry is the most important ministry. Mm. Because if you don't do what you do well, we are not going to be competitive, mm. and companies that we have are going to be taken away from us mm. as production places that are more competitive. So Sean Cunningham, Cunningham argues that this fourth industrial revolution is a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift because it requires new forms of leaders to emerge across the spectrum. If you go to our parliament and you ask the questions uh, about the fourth industrial revolution and any other technological matters, and less than 10% of the people can answer the questions correctly, you should be worried wow. about the future of the world of work. So across the board, we require new types of leaders who actually understand this shift that is happening around us and who are going to appropriately devise strategies to be able to make the South African economy competitive. And what is this kind of leadership that we require? In my book, Leading in the 21st Century, I say, those who do not read must not lead. <laughs> those who do not read must not lead, lest they will lead us into temptations and lead us into poverty. <laughs> so reading is a very important part of leadership that we require. Mm -hmm in this era of great change. And this leadership should embrace change as a constant. It should embrace learning in all its facets and all its complexity. Such leadership should understand that communication is much more complicated than the ability to speak. You must be able to write. 
you must be able to understand technology. And of course, such, a, such leadership must embrace diversity. There is a very close connection between innovation and diversity. If you put people who think alike in one room and hope for a solution, you are not going to do better than if you put different people in one room. So we need to broaden leadership, whether it is the issue of uh, race, whether it is the issue of gender, whether it is the issue of geography, and so on and so forth. And of course, such leadership must understand technology. Understanding technology is very, very important. And one of the things that we need to do, um, uh, Vice Chancellor, is that we need to inculcate the culture of multidisciplinary education in our university system. And of course, I say this because the problems of today does not require a single I once sat with a German ambassador and we were discussing about why there is no German version of Facebook <laughs> or Twitter or any of these new types of technologies, even though Germany is actually technologically very advanced. And the conclusion that we reached is that German education is very multidisciplinary, is very unidisciplinary. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, when he was at Harvard, he was studying computer science and psychology. I don't know whether in South Africa you can find somebody <laughs> in psychology. But it goes without saying that if you are going to be a social network engineer, of course you must understand how to code, but you must also understand how people work. And the Americans actually do this very, very well. Just to uh, narrate a personal story, I was an undergraduate student in North America. And I had transferred from a university at the Cape next to the Table Mountain. <laughs> and I was studying mechanical engineering. And uh, one thing that really shook me was how different what I was learning in North America from what I was learning uh, at the bottom of Table Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that shook me was the requirement that I have to take. I'm doing mechanical engineering, mm. 12 semesters of human and social sciences. And six of them must be in a single discipline. So I started with acting. Acting one, stagecraft, and acting three. <laughs> so the reason you don't see me in Mubago has nothing to do with <laughs> 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 I can't go to there, I know what to do. <laughs> then I took psychology one and psychology two. Then I took history of South Africa, which I had to wait several semesters because it was it was full. You know. How in the world people in Ohio wanted to study South African history it still remains a mystery. And then I took uh, economic, six economic classes. Now in artificial intelligence there is an algorithm called reinforcement learning. Yeah. Uh, 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 somebody was telling me that he did a PhD in reinforcement learning here. And reinforcement learning, I did not learn it in engineering. I actually learned it in psychology. It starts with a Russian psychologist called Pavlov and his dogs. <laughs> and he will ring a bell and feed the dogs. And ring a bell and feed the dogs. And psychologically, the, the, the psychological concept of that is called um, reinforcement. You are reinforcing the idea, it's conditioning. You are conditioning the dog so that every time the bell rings, it 
knows it is time to be fed. And that is the, it is that idea that Google used when it was designing AlphaGo uh, that was able to solve the Go game, which is a complicated version of, of Chinese chess. And of course, when uh, the discoverer of reinforcement, not the discoverer of reinforcement then, the, uh, Mr. Sutton did not discover reinforcement then. He just brought it to the field of artificial intelligence, Professor Andromano. And he couldn't have done that if he did not understand psychology and also understood computer science. So the education vice chancellor, Peterson, that we need to give must be multidisciplinary. What we have done at the University of Johannesburg, all students, and Mr. Munisi, who is one of your workers, who was a student there, have to take a course called Introduction to artificial intelligence. Doesn't matter what you are doing, and and you get in, uh, you can't graduate without it, but you get a separate certificate. They also have to take a course called the Africa Insights module. All of them, where they learn African politics, economy, and history. So that is very very important. And of course. Because we are living, living in such a turbulent time. We are living in turbulent times. Such a leader must be able to understand crisis and be able to learn how to deal with crisis. In fact, there is a new term in the Oxford Dictionary called perma crisis which basically means that we're going to live in an era where crises are going to be permanent. And leaders must be able to deal with issues of crisis all the time. How do we educate our, our students so that they are able to navigate well in this new era of perma crisis? One of the things that we have done in order to get our students to be able to learn to deal with complex issues that are out of the ordinary is a project that we call Africa by Bus. Where we, take, we have taken 15,000 of our students by bus to the rest of the African continent. We have taken them to Lesotho, not too far from here. Lots of cultural affinity with South Africa, so they don't learn much. <laughs> <laughs> we have taken them to Swaziland, a great deal of cultural uh, affinity with South Africa, so they learn, but they don't learn much. By bus. We have taken them to uh, Botswana, again, uh, culturally very close to South Africa, and we took them to uh, Namibia which becomes, starts to become different. Even the languages start to become difficult to, to understand by birth. And many of them were in a desert for the first time in their lives. In fact, over 95% of the students who have taken uh, 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 by birth had never had passports before. We have taken them to uh, Mozambique, a uh, different paradigm, given the fact that they were colonized by, by the Portuguese. How in the world anybody can be colonized by the Portuguese? <laughs> it's a mystery that they need to protect. <laughs> and of course, when they were in, in Mozambique, they actually got COVID. <laughs> And uh, the difficulty of moving from one country to another, if you have COVID, became a reality for them. It became a crisis that needed to be done. You know, you, can't, you couldn't quite travel if you knew you were, you know, and, and they were on the other side. You know, I was happy that they were on the other side. <laughs> because it did 
spend the crisis. And the whole thing was for them to learn that when things are going well, a crisis can just emerge from nowhere. And we have to learn to deal with it. We have taken them to Zimbabwe by bus. We have taken them to uh, Zambia by bus. We have taken them to Kampala by bus. Uh, to Kigali by, by, by bus. And many of them uh, were telling us uh, stories about how in, in, in Kampala they can hear people speak. People can't really speak about them without them knowing. And of course, it starts telling them that maybe these languages were the same before. You know, and for those who like evolution, the concept of evolution of languages because of geographic movement becomes an interesting proposition. Uh, and the topic, one of the topics that have not been done in an era where we have to digitize African languages. So these are the things that we need to do, to, to, to the culture that we need to inculcate. The other culture that we need to inculcate is the culture of being adaptive. One of the most misquoted person is Charles Darwin. Because many people, when we talk about Charles Darwin, they say, the survivor of the fittest. <laughs> but if I were to quote him himself, he says, and I quote, it is not the strongest. He did not say it is the strongest. He said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives. No, the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change that is going to survive. So it's not the survival of the fittest. It is the survival of the most adaptive amongst us that are going to thrive. And of course, there are many things that we need to um, to do. You know, speaking multiple languages is a good attribute if you want to inculcate the culture of adaptability. And one of the things that I like about South African campuses is the number of languages that are spoken on our campus. Francis, I don't know whether you have the figure here at UFS. How many languages are spoken? Different languages are spoken on your campus on a daily basis. But at the University of Johannesburg, it was over 50 languages that are spoken. Over. You know, and that might even be an underestimation. Because uh, that person who comes from China speaks Chinese over the phone. Uh, on our campus, <laughs> to their families in China. <laughs> so these are the things that are quite important. So as we as we learn to diversify and make our education inculcate the culture of adaptability, we also need to understand that. Is something about doing things together. Society that thrives know when to work individually and when to work collectively. And I think that is actually quite important. And the fourth industrial revolution actually requires that because it is really the convergence of men and machine to become a single system. Which means that whoever is going to design these machines will have to understand the person and will also have to understand the machine at the same time. So, as we move and try to make 
essence of this fourth industrial revolution. And I'm going to quote Klaus Schwab <laughs> and what kind of leaders uh, are needed in this fourth industrial revolution era. And I quote, Today's leaders and decision makers, however, are too often trapped in traditional linear thinking or too absorbed by the multiple crises demanding their attention to think strategically about the forces of disruption and innovation shaping their organization's future. And I think this is what a DG <laughs> has to permeate to all parts of our government. Innovative thinking. It has to permeate, and of course, your department is the source. Is the source. How do we create a culture of innovation in DTI? And what is the role of science and innovation in that? How about in transport? Very, very important, complicated problems there, but that require uh, innovative, <coughs> innovative thinking. How do you capacitate the people there? The National uh, 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 School of Government is doing part of that. How do universities come into the equation? Because universities in South Africa are still the largest single concentration of knowledge and innovation. Yes, there is innovation that happens in companies, but this is the place where it is supposed to happen. And of course, what we, what we also need to focus on is how do we translate the latent potential that exists through technology and new approaches to leadership in order to deal with many of the developmental challenges that we face. Whether it is the issue of poverty, whether it is the issue of diseases, whether it is the issue of joblessness, whether it is the issue of declining economy, whether it is the issue of food insecurity, food security, to name just a few. And all these things require very, very complicated thinking. A few years ago, I decided that I'm going to become a farmer. So I went and bought a, a, a farm. I even got uh, uh, MEC. I even got uh, uh, goats and uh, chicken and uh, those ones that run around, you know, but mainly to deal with uh, uh, the, the, the things uh, that uh, um, that 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 that, that, that um, we, uh, ants that I don't know what you call them uh, that uh, you see on on my gold and I never I never realized how complex agriculture was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, issues of uh, inbreeding becomes an issue. I did not know about that. I did not know about inbreeding. You know. Uh, uh, and every uh, first Thursday of the month, there is an auction. So I went and bought, and somebody who is quite experienced in that era asked me, says, did you talk to a vet of the area? <coughs> I said, why? Uh, I, I, had no, <laughs> I had no animals that were sick. <laughs> That's the man who knows which stock is good, which stock is not good. Because when they are sick, he's the one who deals with them. That is why he's normally the most successful farmer in the area. You know, lesson number one. <laughs> then I hear that uh, my goats are dying because of something called heavy water. What is heavy water? <laughs> you know, in a nuclear reactor, we know about heavy water. Now, what, what, what is nuclear science it has to do with goals? <laughs> and then later on, we heard that there was some plant that was poisonous. It's actually something that really requires 
science. And that is why the relationship between science and innovation and its research infrastructure, such as the National Research Foundation, is very, very key to agriculture. And those programs, and, and normally we say it's agricultural research cancer, but it's much more complicated than that. Because it is about by, 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 by technology. It is about many, many things that we, we don't know about. So we need to kill uh, the, the silo. Now come, uh, going to the conclusion of my talk, we need to create the ability of our institutions to absorb all these knowledges that are coming just in front of us. We need now check uh, G, uh, GPT. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. What is the strategy so that they can be able to understand this technology, our people? It's a reactive strategy because it is changing you know, uh, the integrity of our, of our examination process much, much more rapidly. What is the role of science and innovation in that? What is the role of, uh, of the NRF? Do we need to have uh, uh, research projects uh, to incentivize people to study these emerging things? And this is just one example. There are many other things that are happening that require our immediate uh, attention. And of course, SIEs to the United Nations in Japan and start greeting people with the words konnichiwa. <laughs> <laughs> and start saying arigato instead of kialimua <laughs> I wish all of you all the best as I go and work uh, in the world and I'm confident that uh, we have everything that it takes for us to be able to <laughs> Deal with the problems that we face. Now, in summary, what kind of leaders do we need to navigate this? I have, I've talked about reading, I have talked about multidisciplinary thinking, I have talked about innovation, I have talked about the ability to understand science and technology, uh, DG, I have talked about uh, the ability to react quickly to the developments that are happening around us, adaptability. The second question, what kind of education do we need to ensure that the changes happening around us does not consume us into irrelevance, but we are part of, we benefit from it? I've talked about multidisciplinary education. That is diverse. The internationalization of our campuses is not a luxury, but a necessity. The ability to show our students what is happening uh, across the board is very, very important. You can't come and study in the free state and never visit Lesotho, for example, uh, and, and so on and so forth. <coughs> How do we ensure that there is equitable contribution uh, to climate change? And I say this because in South Africa today there is a big debate between coal and renewable IPPs. IPPs. I don't think it is a helpful debate. We will have to do a just transition. We will have to be innovative. One of the things that we have done at the University of Johannesburg, 20% of our, of our power is actually from solar. So when you come where you see where we park the cars, on top is solar panels. And we found out that the payback time is 2.9 years. In less than three years, you recoup your investment. It's actually a mix. 
we must have a mix and we must put incentives to ensure that we absorb such mix. On the issue of global peace, what is to be done? What is our role? Africa has many conflicts, of course. Uh, how, how does it come into our research agenda to make sure that we deal with issues of peace in a rational way? How do we educate our, 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 our leaders so that they understand the importance of peace? I tell my uh, SRC leaders, and uh, one of my former presidents, Mr. Munisi, is here, that one of the things that I used to emphasize to the SRC, that you, cannot, you are not preparing yourself to be a leader if your every statement starts with, we demand. <laughs> <laughs> you are not leading. You know, you have to be part of the solution. And you have to understand that the world is so complex that you have to negotiate, not demand. And of course, if you become a leader, you will realize very soon that Certainly globally, what you demand, you don't get. Mm -hmm. What you negotiate, but you can negotiate a good deal for your people. If you, you hone the skills of negotiating, which starts with understanding problems in all their complexities. I thank you very much, uh, and, and in closing, I'm going to quote the former president of United States, John F. Kennedy, who once said, and I quote, leadership and learning are indispensable to each other, close quote. In this era, this is a mantra we must repeat and personify. This is how we ensure 21st, we ensure that 21st century leaders can succeed. I thank you very much. Kia